Well, welcome to the uh, Ezra Bible Institute for Ministry, and this is your hermeneutical lesson on lit on the literary element, and we're going to be taking a good look at the writings or the types of writings. Uh, it's almost as if um, if you were to go into a movie theater and you would see a romance movie, a thriller. Uh, a fantasy, you see all the different type of books or, or a library, you see the genre of categories. Well, the, bio, the Word of God is also written in um, categories. It's also written in uh, um, what we would call uh, topics and and uh, different uh, different types of writings or genres of writings, and so we're gonna we're gonna take a good look at this because this uh, this literary element is a key component to translating and interpreting a scripture correctly. This gives us good perspective on context. This gives us good perspective on the purpose of, the type of writing it is. And so we're going to, again, take a good look at the literary because this is extremely important in uh, translating and a hermeneutical system. Okay, and so we want to make sure that we are interpreting and translating and filtering all the information we can through the right lenses. Okay, and that's why it's important to understand the types of writing or the different types of writing. So let's look at the at, at a few of the types of writings. They got some history writings, and now, now this is biblical history. Okay, this is biblical history. Uh, Genesis and Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, uh, and you see them here on the screen. First and Second Chronicles, the Book of Acts. These are the histories. Uh, these are history books, or um, where you can trace historical um, historical actions that God recorded. Oh, God had man record. There are letters. Paul wrote thirteen letters. Okay, we're gonna get into letters in a in a towards the end. Um, John wrote three letters. Peter wrote two. James uh, James wrote letter a letter. The book of Hebrews, Jude, the book of Revelations. Okay, there's poetry. Okay, now again, these are types of writing. These are genres of writings. Okay, and you read every different type of writing differently. It's it's almost like if you would go to a movie and you saw you you went to a um, you went to go see a romance movie, and all of a sudden, um, it turned it to be a horror movie. Well, you would you would definitely approach that different because you had one set of emotions going in where you're going to watch a nice love story, but you got surprised by by the gory details of that movie because it you you didn't go in there with the right premise. You you were taken by surprise, and so so. So it is with the writings in the Word of God, because letters and history book and the histories, um, the poetry, you know, Psalms and Songs of Solomon, much of much other of the other prophetic material. So there's different prophetic materials within the Word of God that need to be handled as such. Okay, so we can right away see that there are different types of writings. Again, there's the history, there's the letters, there's the poetry. There's also then the wisdom letters, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, Psalms, the book of James uh, speaks and is very highly uh, saturated with wisdom scriptures, how to interact in society, how to interact within the church, the wisdom uh, scriptures, the apocalyptic, the end times, or the or the judgment scriptures are there uh, in the book of Revelations, Daniel 7 through 12, Zechariah, parts of Ezekiel, the book of Mark speaks of the apocalyptic times. Then there are the legal writings and the law, parts of Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Then there's the Gospels, okay? The good news, the good news, the life of Christ, right? The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then within the Gospels, and even within within the Word of God in the in um in the in the in the book of Samuel is the parables, right? Parables that are in the four gospels. Then then Nathan uses the parable in 2 Samuel uh, 12, 1 through 4, with, uh, with David when, um, he, when he called David on his stuff, which was, again, a different type 
of writing, a different type of reading, okay? Don't forget, the literary makes you focus in on the type of writing that it is, okay? And then that way the reader can prepare to interpret in the lens of why it was written or how it was written and who it was written to okay so the literary context or what you are studying now it's a very technical part but you handle a psalms different than you do a uh, wisdom uh than a um than a law chapter okay even though you can inter intertwine them in thought but they are read differently okay the Gospels are handled different than the letters, okay? You, you read them different, okay? So here we have, again, another set of different types of writings that you have, okay? And so we need to prepare ourselves to be able to identify the types of writings, okay? The types of writings. This helps you in, in the prophetic. When you start reading correctly, you can start prophesying correctly. You can start using scriptures correctly in your prophecies and matching them to your unction, okay, that you are feeling from the Holy Spirit. So this is vital, okay, that the literary element be focused on when you are reading any portion of scripture, okay? Now remember, genres uh, impact interpretation of scriptures. Okay, we're going to look at some of this. We're going to look at us. We're going to look at Amerismus. Okay, now you say, well, what is that? Well, uh, Amerismus is is a type of writing, and we see it in the poetry where you have um, you have two opposite end thoughts that mean one main thing okay it's like two bookends it's like it's like bumper to bumper um the concept of bumper to bumper um um car car coverage you don't say well is my is my horn covered is my are my tires covered is my engine covered no when they say bumper to bumper that means everything in the middle okay so we're going to look at amerismus okay now this is a this is a literary uh, 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 um tense or a usage or a word but it's a type of writing okay and you'll be able to identify it okay because within this scripture of psalms 92 1 and 2 as we read it i want to show you the difference so you can start identifying the type of writings there are uh, it says it is good to give thanks to the lord and to sing praises to your name O most high declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. Now, if you were to read this and just take it for for as it's written, you say you would actually sit there and say, "Well, I'm going to be giving thanks all day long." And we all know that you know we have different things going on to where we just can't sit there in the posture of praise all day long, um, or we wouldn't get anything naturally done. However. Let's look at the merismus of this, okay? It is good to give thanks to the Lord, okay? And to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and in the night. So here, let's take a good look at the first uh, word, good, okay? It is good. Well, we know here in the English, now this is literary and poetry writing uh, on even some Hebrew thought in the word, it is good. Now, here here on the west we would think well it's good good means good for mm, good there's not too much punch in 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 that word good how you doing today good right that we we translate it that way but in the hebrew mindset when it says it is good that means it is essential it is important there's there's there is um in um there is an um, uh a force behind it it is good in other words there's there's a posture of your heart that you must take on every single day that's essential to have a blessed day okay from the sun up to the sunset okay now watch watch what happens here and to sing praises to your name almost high to declare your loving kindness in the morning that's the one book and and every and your faithfulness at night so here you have a marismus where you take the morning and the night and that is a bookend or that is a bumper to bumper scripture that there's a that 
in the middle of morning and night, you have your praises all day long. So it's a sandwich thought between two extreme opposites. Morning is one side, night is another. That's two opposite, two opposite um, ideas or, or spheres that that when using them together, guess what? They book in a thought. They book in a. They book in a, an idea. And again, this is this is extremely important in reading and being able to identify the bookends. Okay, to declare your loving kindness in the morning. Boom, that's one. And then your faithfulness every night. Boom. So you have the morning and the night. But what happens in the mid afternoon? Well, that is left into and sing praises to your name. So if you start in the morning, right, then your heart is postured to go into praise all day long, even to the evening. Now, again, that is a marismus. Two opposite thoughts. Okay, a morning and a night. You cannot separate the morning and the night because that keeps together the middle. Okay, that takes you. It's it's just not declare your loving kindness in the morning, right? And you say nothing at night, then it is incomplete. But because our our psalmist he writes in the morning and in the night, guess what happens? He bookends a thought to what? To sing praises to your name. Why? Because it's imperative. It's important. It's the main thing of your life. There, it's good. It's essential. Okay, it's important to do that. Amen. So let let's again let's keep moving forward. So a mer um, a is an idea of extreme to explain the whole again, like bumper to bumper uh, car car coverage. Okay. That warranty, that bumper to bumper warranty. You don't start asking, is the bump, is the, is my, is my, um, is the upholstery covered? Is the engine covered? You don't ask that because it's bumper to bumper. So that's the idea of the writing in the book of Psalms. Okay. And to be able to identify those, those types of writings. Okay. That's the literal element where you are you are looking at the type of writing that it is you're looking at uh, why it's written and to whom it's written watch this meaning of the text means more when you understand the type of writing that it is that's very key okay because now you can start interpreting or translating or or really getting a greater hold of the, the meaning of the scripture when you understand the type of writing it is. Now, that was a um poetry that has two opposite end ideas, right? And with a thought in the middle, what? The loving kindness all day long, singing all day long, went in the morning all the way to the evening, right? That is a good thing, okay? So again, that is a type of reading you'll find in the book of Psalms, okay? Here's another type of writing that there is. There's the hyperbole or um, uh, hyperbole, uh, hyperbole uh, preaching. And now Jesus used this quite a bit, okay? Hyperbole, which means the gross of an exaggeration to make a memorable point, okay? So hyperbole, that's where you get hyperbole from. Well, it's, it's not a bunch of hyperbole, but the Greek word is high hyperbole. I mean, high thought. I mean, a, a word that's way out in the way above everything and you just throw it out there. Okay, let's look at this again, because you have to understand when it's hyperbole or when it's uh, hyperbole speaking. Okay, watch this. Watch, watch the hype. Watch the um hyperbole that Christ used. It says this, Matthew uh, 5, 29, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck out, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you um, that one of your members perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. Now watch this. This is a key. This is a key element. Now, Again, if you take that literal, if you just read it, well, then you got to cut your eye out. You got to, you got, you got to cut your arm off. You got to cut your hand off. Now, 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 again, he's throwing this high, this, this high concept out there. But listen to what it means. He says, what the Bible says isn't what it actually means. He's not telling you to really take your eye out. He's talking about discipline. He's talking, he's talking about, um, 
He's talking about you taking care of your appetites. He's talking about you taking care of your conscience. He's talking about you making sure that your body is under control. Okay. Again, he's saying if your eye causes you to sin, he throws that way out there. Okay. He throws that way out there. Way high. Now you can't do that literally. There's some people that have more than likely, but you, we know that's not what he means. There is another meaning to that word. It's a high thought. He throws it out there to get the concept going. Um, it's hyperbole. It's, it's, it's speaking really high, an, an exaggeration. But the concept is you need to take care of what you watch. You need to take, take care of um, what, you, what you do with your body. You need to pay attention to those things. Okay, because don't forget what the Bible says isn't actually what it means. Okay, so you're going to have to translate this. And so hy um, hyperbole, okay, hyperbole is also is also a, a type of writings that you will read in the word of God. Okay, again, hyperbole. Okay, hyper means very high. Bole means to throw. Okay, so God will throw something really high out there. Okay, and that, but you're going to have to find out what it means. He's, he's using hyperbole. Okay, many preachers use hyperbole to prove a point. They don't mean it. It's an exaggerated talk. It's, 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 it's extensive in its illustration, but you get the message. Okay, and so Jesus was, can you imagine the disciples saying, what? We're going to have to pluck out our eyes. We're going to cut off our hands. We're going to have to, man, you know, who can make it in? But he was, he was what? He was throwing a high thought out. Okay, he threw a high thought out there and causing them to think okay what the bible says isn't actually what it means all the time okay you have to understand when it's hyperbole being used okay you have to understand the the apocalyptic okay the apocalyptic the translative the the things that the scriptures that bring um translative uh, perspectives Okay, uh, here's an uh, here's an apocalyptic on Revelation 13 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns and on his horns, ten crowns and on his head, um, a blasphemous name. Now, we you can look at this. This is what that beast would look like. There's the seven heads. There's the crown. There's the horns. You know, there, there's there it is. That's what it looks like. But the question is, what does it mean? You know now that this is an apocalyptic scripture, that there is a meaning beyond what you read. Okay, it's a type of writing. Okay, there are books that are types of writing. Okay, and that you have to be able to distinguish. Okay, and this is another one, the apocalyptic. Okay, now here's another one. Okay, here's another apocalyptic writing, <laughs> writing, writings uses storms. Now listen, writings use symbols. They use storms, hail, numbers, and animals in metaphors and symbolic ways. Here, okay, you have, you're in the Oval Office and you have an elephant. What does that mean? Okay, who's the elephant? Well, that's the Republican. You got the donkey, right? That's the, that's the, and he's kicking the flag. Okay, well, what do you think is happening in the Democratic Party in this illustration here? Well, this is apocalyptic writing. We're looking at the end times when it looks like the donkeys or the Democrats are losing their minds. Okay, they're, they're going against the constitutional republic that we have. Right. Well, this is a picture. You can see the picture, okay, of an end time or even a current time that's apocalyptic or dangerous in nature. So sometimes we could read the scriptures, okay, where the, you'll see again storm and hail and numbers and animals and, and metaphors and symbolic types, okay. So you're going to have to be, you're going to have to look into God's word and realize, is it a metaphor? Is it symbolic? Um, what do storms mean? What do, what does hell mean? What, what does the numbers mean? Okay. Because all this is all part of the type of writing that you will run into in the word of God. Okay. Here's an example. Okay. There are wisdom scriptures. Okay. There's wisdom scriptures. Okay. Proverbs 24, 4 and 5. 
do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you become like him. Now this is, now, now follow the thought. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Well, what does that mean? Look, look at what is, what, look at, look at what is here. Okay. Okay. Answer, if you answer a fool, you'll be just like him. Okay. In other words, if you confront him, then you will become like him. And then he says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Well, so in one part of the scripture, he tells you to, to uh, don't answer him. Then in the other part of the scripture, um, of Proverbs, he tells you, answer him, lest he thinks he's wise in his own eyes. Well, that reminds me of, of, of a certain, certain individual, I won't name names, um, to protect the innocent. However, th this young man thought that he, he, um, he was mouthing off a little bit, talking behind certain people's backs and, and trying to get attention. And, um, you know, I thought it best not to engage with him. Okay. I didn't engage with him at all. However, when I saw that he was coming to affect my family, Okay, with with certain uh, foolishness, I had to confront him lest he think that he would become wise in his own eyes. So there was a time to confront him and there's a time not to. See, that's the wisdom scripture. Okay, that's how you use, you recognize the wisdom scripture. Don't get confused with do not answer the fool according to his folly lest he also, lest you also be like him. Okay. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Okay, so he's saying don't answer him, and then answer him. You get kind of confused. But when you look at the wisdom part of this, the wisdom in here is telling you, listen, there's a time to confront him. Now's not the time. But then there is a time to confront him, lest he thinks he's wise in his own eyes. Okay. And a lot of, a lot of times what I like to use, I like to use a law scripture. Okay. What's a law scripture? A law scripture is a scripture that is true all the time. That's how it becomes a law, a principle, a principled scripture. We'll get into some of those in, in, in the next uh, few slides. So again, so there are, there are wisdom scriptures that you have to learn how to, how to find out what they mean. How do we apply them? Okay. Don't answer a fool. Okay, and then right below it says, answer a fool. Okay, but when? That's the wisdom. That's what Proverbs is all about. It's an example of how to read a proverb. But you got to understand that there are, there are writings that are pure wisdom. Okay, here's, here's the wisdom literature gives insight into how to live in God and with your neighbors. Law literature is used alongside to help interpret wisdom verses because laws are timeless and relevant in all situations. Okay, so the law of God is 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 good for all situations, but it it but it stabilizes the wisdom that you want to use. Okay, so again, we're going to look at some law scriptures in um you know in a, in a little bit, but that's how you that's how you support. Um, your wisdom scripture, your Proverbs, you find law scriptures that will support it. Wisdom literature opens the door to choice. Okay. Wisdom scriptures, and that, that's very good. Okay. Uh, to understand is that wisdom literature opens the door to choice. So we're going to have to know the type of writings that we're reading so that we can realize, is it a law scripture that gives me no choice, or is it a wisdom scripture that allows me to expand my, my horizons and my thought life, okay? Here's, here's a parable, okay? Now, we all know this, okay? Now, we all know this. Uh, Luke, and we've read it, and we probably have heard it um, so many times preached in your church, okay? Here's a parable. Okay, parabole. This is a parabole. I'll get into that, what a parable is. 
Luke 16, 19 through 31. I'm, I just got a little bit of it here, but you can read the context at home. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple with a fine linen and fared uh, sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, designed to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to the to Abraham's belly, which the man also died and was buried. So now you have a story here where Laz, rich man Lazarus dies and he goes into Abraham's belly. And then you have you have um, the poor man that goes into hell, Hades and he's and he's dying and he's hurting and and he's feeling the pain and, and and so what what does a parable do? A parable gives you the spiritual truths, okay, the truths that you want to convey through a story, through an illustration. That's a para. Para means to be alongside. P a r a in the Greek is to be alongside. Bole that means to throw so you're going to throw a truth alongside a story okay so here you have a parable of the rich man and he is and he he is he is able to he's trying to communicate to to um to lazarus he's trying to communicate to abraham he's trying to talk now listen many of these things here are are what you will call have many truths in it but watch this. A parable is a special type of writing that must uh, that must be as a parable as a as meant to be read. In other words, don't make the parable what it's not. That's reading it correctly. OK, reading it correctly. OK, like Abraham, like uh, like Lazarus able to speak to Abraham. OK, Ab uh, the 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 um, the. Uh, the rich man able to able to make requests and make there's a lot of truths in there okay but it's a parable okay it's a story um, with truth throughout in it so you read it that way okay and don't make it say what it's not meant to say again how you read it literal how what type of reading um, is it what type of writing is is it and i must approach it that way okay we'll we'll get more into uh the, these type of discussions okay the literary element okay literary devices in a letter okay now again we're going to talk about letters now okay the parakaleo the parakaleo uh, aspect okay the appeal okay this is the appeal the letters okay we went through wisdom we went through um parables the types of writings we went through poetry we went through uh, now we're getting into the letters okay let's look at the letters uh there's four parts to the to the letters okay to a letter this is how they used to write this is how paul wrote okay there's four parts or the fixed sayings or the formula of a letter number one is the verb i appeal or its synonym i ask in the first person okay so this is this is this is very um apparent in Paul's writings okay we'll we'll show this but here it is the recipients of the appeal who is he writing to the preposition of the phrase indicating sources of the sender's authority to the appeal this element typically occurs only in the official correspondence and not in private letters okay in other words this is a very formal letter he's he's making an appeal to them he's making a request based on his authority to them and over them and with them relationally okay the content introduced by by that a clause okay so here's a good example okay here's a good example uh, I beseech you brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to God which is a reasonable service now this is Paul's writing but watch the verb is I appeal this is again He's appealing to them, I, or I'm begging you, okay? I'm beseeching you, 
Who's the recipient? The brothers are the recipients of this. The preposition, by the mercies of God. In other words, that's the initiating factor of all that I'm asking you. This has given me authority to relay this message to you. A prepositional phrase, by the mercies of God. And the content is that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. This is four levels within a letter or within the writings of Paul that are very consistent. Okay, now we're going to look at a few, uh, another different uh, letter. Okay, but it's an appeal letter, but it's a little stronger than that. Okay, because Paul knows how to shift gears. Again, these are letters. Okay, now we're looking at letters. Am I reading a letter? Okay, I, I also want to add to you that letters are situationals. Okay, in other words, Paul was writing to letters to Romans, to 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians. He was writing into Colossians. He was writing to Philippi. He was writing those letters into situations, okay? Things that they were going through, questions that they had, okay? Uh, things that were brought to his attention. He was responding to many of them, okay? Those are letters, okay? So how do you read a letter? You look to who it's addressed to, okay? What are they asking? Who are they writing to? What are they asking of me? And what is my response to it? See, the four steps are right there. I just laid them out for you. Okay. Okay. So again, follow the concepts here. Okay. Okay. Here's another example of the letters. You can find, you can find this letter writing concepts. Okay. On how Paul wrote his letters. This is the pattern you'll find it in uh, Romans 15, 30. Romans 16, 17, you could see that on the screen that you have, you have uh, six or seven um, or eight uh, um, examples that I gave you where you can see the patterns of Paul's writings. Now, you know, your homework assignment is going to have some of that in there. Okay. This shows the consistent pattern of pattern of letter writing used by Paul. Again, when you, when they went to, to, uh, um, to, to, to the to the manuscripts and they looked at the original manuscripts again they were looking at the patterns of the letters did it look like Paul's addressing okay did or did somebody change it and just have some Paul's thoughts okay again this is the importance of understanding the pattern of writing letters especially back in the time of Paul Okay, in the early church. Okay, there was a way that they wrote letters, and this these letters are very consistent. All these scriptures here are very consistent with Paul writing these letters. Okay. Okay. Now what's the what's the function? The primary function, okay, don't forget the, the primary function, the reason there was such a the reason there was such a need to to understand the rhythm or the pattern of of writing you know the four steps that you that we laid out for you is because the 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 transition from topic to topic because again we're spoiled by by chapter and verse okay they didn't have it until the chapters didn't come into 10 AD um to uh, yeah the year uh 100 AD and then the verses 1400 AD okay so here here you have you have a a huge amount of of transitioning that people had to do. They had to transition themselves. Okay, they had to th read the the rhythm of Paul's letters. Okay, formula marks transition either from the end of the Thanksgiving to the beginning of the letter. So again, you'll see Paul's writing of letters, how he thanks them, how he how he how he writes his body, how he does, it's all right here, Romans 12, 1, again, here's, you have a, you have a, a series of scriptures here on how Paul wrote his letter, again, when you start to, to um, read letters, the way letters were intended to read, then you will preach them different, and you will hear them different, okay, you will hear a letter different than you would a Proverbs or a Psalms, Okay, again, this is liter this is liter literal uh, element of theology. Okay, what am I reading? What type of writing is it? Is it a psalm? Is it is a letter? Is it a book of wisdom? Is is what is it? That way I can read it correctly because don't forget there's a genre 
of writings. There's many types of writings which require us to know what type of writings they are. Are they a historical writing? Is it part of the historical books? Part of the prophets books? The minor prophets? The major prophets? Is it a messianic scripture? Okay, those are all types of writings okay there's types of writings that require you to identify what type it is and that's why it's important to have this literary uh, concept down in your hermeneutics okay this helps you interpret the scriptures correctly now watch this function continued the secondary function the appeal formula used in an official correspondence when the writer has had a good relationship with the recipients and confidently expect them to do the content of the letter in other words when they're comfortable when Paul was comfortable with them Paul started putting more pressure on them okay he started putting the he started putting the gun to the head he started pulling out his gun and putting it on the table and letting them know that you there's some things that that you have to do okay because of the relationship because of his apostolic covering over them in Paul's letters he used a a, a stronger sense if you will okay somebody that is very close to you uh, they they can tell you things that are stronger than than a stranger okay well Paul has has another appeal okay Paul uses the appeal formula in a nuanced manner where his authority is not questioned and he can make a, a request where rather than a forceful command in other words they know that Paul will not lead them astray so Paul's going to make Paul's going to make a request to them he's going to request okay them okay then a rather than a forceful command and that's very important to to find out to 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 identify is he is he requesting them or is he making a forceful demand that's the type of letter okay you'll find that in the letters okay and you have to be able to distinguish the two okay is he requesting it or is he forcefully commanding us okay here's here's a good one okay philemon 8 8 uh verse 8 through 10 says therefore though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you huh? he uses that word okay what's the word appeal Parakaleo. I rather I rather come alongside you and partner with you and encourage you to do this okay there it is no, there it is I, I want to appeal to you being such as one as Paul the the aged and now also a prisoner of Christ I appeal to you for my son Onesimus whom I have begotten while in my chains so here Paul is making a request okay for Onesimus okay now this is this is important because again because of his relationship he's not making a command he's making a request okay why because they love Paul they they honor Paul and so because of the relationship Paul can appeal to them okay now again Paul made some pretty if you look at Corinthians okay Paul second Corinthians Paul had a had to use a heavy hand at times that you know I come not in enticing words of man's wisdom but demonstration of the power of God you know he he had a he had a put the gun he had to drop the bomb on them a little bit why because there was there was resistance to his authority there was resistance to his to his uh, um, to his letters and his opinions uh, from heaven that he was writing and giving them so again Paul because of his relationship he can continue to appeal to them without putting a gun to their heads regarding Anisimus okay okay now literary devices in 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 the Hebrew poetry and inclusios okay inclusios okay that now these are these are interesting okay this is another type of writing in the Word of God okay but it's part of the Hebrew poetry inclusios watch this because sometimes referred to as bracketing or envelope structures listen this is important because you find these a lot in Psalms and Proverbs okay you'll find them you'll also find them in in uh, some of Paul's writings okay and you you'll find them um, in James you'll find these these what we will call inclusios okay the repetition of the key word phrase or sentence at the beginning and at the end 
of a literary unit okay in other words you'll have you'll have a you'll have a proverb or a psalm that will make a statement his mercy endures forever and then at the end of the scripture it, at the end of the writing it'll say and his mercy endures forever that's an inclusio that that's that's a book ends okay so you you will be able to identify when something starts with the thought and finishes with the same thought because it becomes an inclusio there's a main thought throughout that whole thing they want to make sure that you start with the right thought and you finish with the right thought that's a literary writing okay and you'll find that more in the poetry the psalms and the proverbs you'll find it there okay psalms 118 uh verse 1 Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. Okay, boom. Then you go all the way to the last verse and says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. An inclusio. That's a type of writing. That's a type. That's a style of writing that if you can identify them, it will greatly enhance your ability to interpret or stay in the moment and the rhythm of why that Psalms was written and to whom it was written and then bring it into today. And what does it mean for us today? That's the inclusio writing. Okay. Let's look at this common convictions of liter literary criticisms. Okay. Now, again, the criticism, literary criticism. In other words, when, when someone has, um, a, a, a different perspective where they're going to analyze or and again criticism theological criticism doesn't mean that they're criticizing like we say criticism means that they're going to test it they're going to they're going to take a critical look at it okay that means that they're going to challenge the idea there that's what critical liter, uh, literary criticism is is they're going to test it watch this an appreciation for the sophisticated artistry and the uh, aesthetic quality of the text. Recognize that the Bible is the result of conscious composition, careful patterning, and strategic use of the literary co conventions prevalent in its day. In other words, they're going to take a good look at it and read it for what it is. It's it's careful patterning, it's composition, it's culture of the day, what it meant in that day. And then what it's going to mean to us today so the common conviction of literary criticism okay is when we begin to look at the patterns of the bible the types of writing okay and understand that there's a careful pattern paul wrote letters in patterns there's psalms and proverbs in patterns there's the book of the laws that are in patterns there's a conscious composition in other words someone was thinking how to write this thing and we must we must respect that we must respect the fact that it was put together by the mighty hand of god okay and that's important okay literary criticism that when we look at it we analyze it correctly we put it through the right lens we treat it correctly common convictions of literary criticism a preoccupation with the form of the text okay what does that mean a preoccupation with the form of the text concerns concern not just on content of the text what is said but also on the form of the text how it was said okay very important concept okay the preoccupation with how it was said okay that that getting caught up in the how and missing the what was said what was said okay not how the time the culture um the the uh the the geographical location okay that's the that's the how it was said that's the form that was in the old time but but yeah but what does it mean today okay convictions of literary criticisms are are really prevalent in the church today because there are some that that don't use certain scriptures or, or won't preach out of the old testament they won't do any of that because of the form it's old testament it's the form it's the old and they only want to do the new testament not understanding that it's all scripture is inspired by god right okay so the concern with genre okay meaning the different types of reading and how it impacts your interpretation so you understand that when you interpret scripture 
you have to identify, is it a wisdom scripture? Is it a law scripture? Is it a historical scripture? Is it a prophetic scripture? It, is, it a, it is, is it a letter to a situation Paul was writing? Is it an encouragement letter? Is it, is, it a, is it a correction letter? Is it an informative letter? You have to find out the rhythms. Why? Because you've got to be concerned with the type of writings. Okay, be very careful not to just um, preach a sermon on thinking, meaning that you have a thought and you're just pulling out scriptures from Google or you're pulling out scriptures from your from your uh, from your little Bible app just to fit your thought when you're giving no thought to how it was written and what it was and what and who it was written to and what type of writing it is. Okay, very important. Okay, concerned with the types of writing. So every time you open your Bible, what type of writing is this? Okay, concerned with the identifying the various literary conventions used by biblical authors and understand what functions these conventions have. In other words, what is the function of the wisdom scripture? What is the function of letters? What's the function? Why are they important? How do they relate to us? And how do they help us? Okay, so don't just run through them and say, well, I read the book of Psalms and, or I read the Proverbs or I read, I read uh, Genesis. Yeah, but did you realize you were reading the history? You're reading the beginnings you were reading. What type of reading was it? What type of topics were there? What type of all those things need to be taken into consideration? Okay, here's the literary element, um, a complete uh, literary guide to the Bible by Lillian Riken. Okay, this is what it says. We cannot fully comprehend the what of the New Testament writers, their religious content, without first paying attention to the how. The literary modes of the content is embodied. In other words, how was it written? Who was it written to? Okay, the how. Okay, the how is important. Okay, how is it written? That's what's important. Is it a letter? Is it a, is it, you know, what is it? Okay, is it a historical book? Is it the book of Acts? It is, is it part of Israel's history? Is it a prophetic book written, has an apocalyptic writing? The how, those are the hows that you have to understand. Okay, common convictions of literary cr criticism. Number three, concerns with treating text as finished holes. Contra, contra liberal scholars who who are preoccupied with various sources lying behind biblical texts and how the author redacted these sources. Okay. Now, this is this is um, how you interpret and what you use to interpret. Okay, can either can either pull you closer or further away. Now, again, there are people that that don't use don't use the 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 literary text, the very liberal in in how they how they interpret the bible okay but we want to we want to um stay true to the text and not get so commentary driven and that's what this talk about you know various sources lying behind the biblical text and how the author redacted these sources okay so again we're going to have to stick to the text because the text will interpret the text contra conservative scholars who are preoccupied with each individual part of the text verse by verse um, by commentary and thus miss the forest for the trees in other words so you can't get so so locked into your your commentaries or your text that you miss what God is really saying you miss the how you miss the what you miss the flavor of the scriptures okay so again literary criticism how you approach it how you look at it okay some will will always try to criticize the bible through their resources and their sources okay common convictions of literary criticism number four exhibits a historical orientation the historical uncertainty surrounding the author's sources in other words we can't verify that we didn't know there was Noah and the ark and they start going into all these different type of things that they fail to the they fail to focus on the text of the scripture. What type of writing is it? Is it historic? Okay, listen, the historical uncertainty surrounding the author, sources, social context, and the readers of the biblical text caused some modern interpreters to ignore the historical questions and instead concentrate on the literary features of the text. In other words, they don't concentrate on how it got there. All they care about is if it makes sense in their scripture today and they lose the flavor of the text. Okay, this is important to understand the historical background of everything. 
Okay, some preachers don't even care about the historical. They don't care if it's a letter. They'll just preach it because they, it fits their point. That's the wrong way to do it. We have to have a theological system that works. Okay. Well, I hope you understood that and got everything down. That that was a lot of content in there. But I pray that you will continue to to study. That you will. Um, get a hold of the genres of the Bible that you understand that there's many types of reading and that there are many types of writings and that you learn to identify them. Again, this will help you interpret the word of God and translate the Bible and understand that you can walk in the wonderful world of God's word. So God bless you. And I pray that you enjoyed this literary con uh, concept to add to your elements of hermeneutics. God bless you.